the application layer. The application layer in itself is an easy topic because we don't do it in this course. In fact, uh, doing an application is part of courses on distributed information systems, for example, or also uh, some of the programming classes or classes like principles of uh, computer systems. But what we will do is the things relative to the application layer that have to do with the fundamental principles of TCP IP. And we will also look at one specific issue, which is the interworking between IPv4 and IPv6. That's the simplest application layer, the, the one that made TCP IP popular, the internet, uh, the web. And the web, as you know, is based on HTTP that uses TCP. That's the principle. Any application layer uses TCP or UDP or both. And you have done your application layer. When we did the lab on uh, socket programming, you did your own application layer. Uh, the application layer typically uses URLs uh, that are a way to define a resource by using a DNS name. We'll speak about DNS in a second. But before that, let me jump to one little question. A popular uh, piece of software is um, FTP. Well, not so popular. We use HTTP more to transfer files, but we can still use FTP to transfer files. Uh, FTP exists in two variants, uh, active and passive. With the active FTP, FTP is a file transfer protocol, but it's more than that. It's a file, tran it's a file transfer protocol and a remote shell. When you use FTP, you have a command line that opens, and you can send commands to the remote machine to delete file, move file, uh, transfer files. So the remote shell is used by a first TCP connection, and then if you want to transfer a file, you open a second TCP connection over which you transfer the file. When the file is completed, you delete, you close the TCP connection, and you can do it in the red way or the green way. If we focus on the red way, which is the historical way of doing FT, uh, FTP, which of the port numbers are TCP server ports? I close in five seconds. And the correct answer is, well, what is a server port? A server port is the one to which you send a SYN packet. Right? The one that's listening for a connection to be opened. So there is one, which is this port number on which you open the TCP connection. And then there is another one here, which is the port number on which you expect the connection to be opened by the server to you. So now this is where the terminology is a bit in collision. The server is, in fact, the client in the second phase of the transfer, and the client is the server. So the correct answer is 21 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, which is number 6 here. Right. Well, that's an example of how interactions can be arbitrarily complex. And this is also uh, why, in fact, this was replaced by that in many instances because with the classical operation of FTP, you need to send a SYN packet back to the source and many companies have strict filtering rules where they allow SYN packets to be sent only to dedicated servers, not to your or my PC. So if you do it the other way around, then you, uh, the SYN packets always go in the same direction here. OK, those are little details that I let you discover in the rest of the slides. What I want to cover now is the DNS, which we have already discovered, of course, because we cannot do anything without the DNS. 
DNS was invented because we believed IP addresses would be too ugly. It was a good idea because with IPv4, they're not that ugly, but with IPv6, they really are. So if you want to talk to a machine, you use its name rather than its IP address. <coughs> In fact, today, if you want to talk to a machine, you use Google search first, probably. So it's perhaps less uh, critical. But uh, the DNS has become extremely popular because now it's used to give names to services. Origi DNS does a lot of things. In a DNS table, there can be zillions of fields, but the practically the most important fields, the ones that are used practically uh, exclusively, are what are called A and quadruple A records, which are translations between names to IP addresses. That's the main function of, of the DNS. So a name like ssc.epfl.ch has nothing to do with the IP address of the server that offers, for example, a web service with that name. The server that offers this can be one of the EPFL machines or can be an external machine that has nothing to do with EPFL. So this indirection is very powerful and that's the main idea. DNS is of course built like any, uh, any naming scheme. You have a hierarchy. The top level are the initially the three letter domains that were the, the historical top levels. Uh, I'm not sure what int is. I don't remember seeing anything. Uh, uh, okay. Com is the most popular one. Edu is for <coughs> universities, in practice, Amer North American universities, American or Canadian. Org is for um, a non profit organization. Net are for things related to the internet, mil to the American military. And then uh, at the origin, there were those three letter so called top level domains. Each of the top level domains is associated with an entity that owns this domain space. And in addition to the three letter, there are the two letter domains that are all geographical. So all two letter domains correspond to a country. CH is Switzerland, CO is Colombia, uh, LY is Libya, etc. And each of them is given to a company or an agency of the government in each of the countries that has the control of who can obtain a number here. Uh, so those domains are misused, for example. You have the dot .li that are used for uh, making so-called shortened URL. But technically speaking, those are domain inside the Libyan uh, uh, domain namespace, which you might not like to, to have. Right? Uh, the names are, in principle, American ASCII. English ASCII, uh, but your, a few years ago, some of your colleagues built up a uh, web service called EPFL, Swiss Germans. Uh, it worked for some years. So this is possible now. Uh, you had all the copies of all the last year's exam with the solutions and everything. That's one there. That was pre-Facebook. Now I guess you do that with Facebook. So there is a mapping from uh, restricted ASCII to those which is uh, called the puny code, which is a complicated code that uses a state, a finite state machine. This is, for example, the translation of this. So e, o, umlaut is an escape. So xn hyphen means here you will put something that will be later explained. And this later explained is, uh, is found here. So this is the true domain name of that thing, but every browser, will dis when it sees this, will display that instead. How does DNS work? I'll explain this on this uh, animation. Lisa connects to a web server by clicking in some way on uh, some URL that contains a name. Then Lisa's machine has a DNS a program, a daemon, that is called a DNS resolver, one or several. You can have one typically per browser. If you use both Chrome and Safari, you will, might have several. Um, so this, when you click on this, your code will do like you did in the, uh, in the Python programming script. You will first try to find what is the IP address that corresponds to this. So this piece of code will contact the DNS server that is part of the IP configuration of the machine. Remember, 
with DHCP or other mechanisms, we need to find a, one or several DNS uh, servers. So it will send a query to the DNS server saying, give me the IP address of this. And IP address in DNS terminology means give me an A record. A means IP address. And it will have RD equal yes. RD means recursive. Recursivity is desired. Recursivity means I would like you, server, to do the, the complete job for me. Well, we'll see why it's called recursive in a second. So when the server gets this message, number two, it will look for www.zurich.ibm.com. Perhaps in this case, it does not have the answer. It would have the answer for any address that is epfl.ch because this DNS name server is the DNS server of epfl. So when the system managers of the epfl network allocate DNS names, they also make sure those names are put into the DNS server of epfl. So the DNS server of EPFL is a table with all the IP addresses that correspond to all the DNS names, all the A records and a few others, but mainly the A records. But this one does not. But instead, it knows, uh, it's a, it's, it's, it will try to find out more. But you will analyze this, it's, it's IBM.com. So it will look, in principle, it will go to all the DNS server addresses that it knows. If it knows nothing, it must know at least the IP addresses of all the top level domains by going to what is called a root server. So there are 13 or 14 root servers in the world that contain the main information for uh, all, the three le all the main uh, top level domains, in particular, .com. So the request number two is sent to .com. Now what does .com have? .com does not have, the .com, the root server, does not have all the uh, uh, tables of all the world, but it has the things that are just below itself. Just below itself is IBM. IBM has obtained a name from the .com domain. That means IBM had to do, had to set up a name server, hopefully two or more for reliability, and the IP addresses of this uh, name server is known to the .com name server. So the server on the right knows the IP address not of the final destination but of a name server for the domain IBM.com. So it will reply to the EPFL domain name server with this IP address of the domain of the of the IBM, so it might be something like this. It will send a response that has an, some information, which is an NS record. NS stands for name server. So it says, here are all the three names of the three DNS servers of IBM. Of course, it's completely useless to send the names. What we want is the IP addresses. So of course, it gives the IP addresses together in the form of a record. So now, the DNS server of EPFL has three IP addresses of DNS servers for IBM. For other companies like Google, everybody knows them. It's 8.8.8, .8 for example. It's well known. Uh, but for most companies, they are not well known, so you need to do that step. Now, LRC SANS will continue the work. This is why it's called recursive. If it would not be recursive, uh, LRC SANS will respond to Lisa's PC, this thing here. So it would be Lisa's PC's job to continue by going to one of those DNS servers. But traditionally, we don't want hosts to do that. It's typically the name server to which your host connects that will do it for you. So the name server will now contact one of the IBM.com domain name server. If the company is very large and organized very, very strictly according to hierarchy, it might continue. We might get a response which is the DNS name, the IP address of the DNS server that serves the Zurich.ibm.com uh, space. In the case of IBM, it's not the case. All IBM servers know of all IBM names, including the subdomains. Therefore, by sending a request to the same request, as you notice here, the same request is sent again to this one, and this one will give the answer, which is the IP address 
of this machine. All of this needs to be done while you click on the, uh, on the URL. So while, of course, this is happening, uh, you do not connect to the server, but you see in your browser uh, some message that indicates that your machine is doing this job here. There are tools like uh, NSLOOKUP that you have used, or DIG, or others, that allow you to look at uh, uh, what is in your local, you know, to, f to do what I've shown on the cartoon and see what is obtained. For example, I looked up, I asked my machine to find the A record that corresponds to lca.epfl.ch, and I found this, and I find also a number here, which is uh, time to live, uh, that I will explain in a second. If instead of A, I ask for quadruple A, we will obtain the IPv6 address of this machine, if there is. Some machines have an IPv4 address, some have an IPv6, some have both. Uh, this is the case of lca.epfl.ch, it has both. So my, mach my machine will have both IPv4 and IPv6 address if it does this. Now, of course, if we do this once, we would like as much as possible to cache it. If somebody at EPFL goes to a website and someone else goes a few minutes later, it's good if the DNS server remembers all the work it has done. So they will do it, of course. They cache, they keep in a cache all the information that has been stored. So that if someone else goes again to ibm.zurich.com, then the DNS server will respond immediately. Like any cache, you need to manage it. You could do two things. You could do a database. The DNS could be a set of databases. But if you've done databases that are distributed, probably you had the experience that you don't like it. Because invariably, databases, if it's not on one big computer in one room, means a lot of delay. So there is no database for DNS. Instead, there is a time to live. The time to leave is the information sent by the IBM server saying how long a record should be kept in the cache. Here it's, for example, two hours. So that means the DNS server will keep it for two hours. If during those two hours somebody asks for this request, it will be responded from the cache. But after two hours, it will be responded. The, the cache will be, entry will be considered stale. We will go again to IBM.com. In this way, we make sure that if there is a change in DNS, we ultimately recover with the new address. But of course, the change may take up to, in that case, up to two hours to be propagated. If we change the DNS name, it takes some time, which is given by the cache. Companies like Google tend to have extremely short, uh, extremely short uh, time to live of a few minutes or even a minute, uh, but that's quite exceptional because they want to do extremely dynamic uh, uh, allocation of all their resources. Voila, that's probably the main thing we'll see on DNS. Uh, bonne fin de journée, see you tomorrow for the lab.